what a treat to have my brother in arms, friend, mentor, inspiration, and all around great guy, Rocco Charman, back for another chat. I'm, I'm excited to be having this one, but excited as we heard off air on a completely different level. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a much more sedate and peaceful version of me that we encountered today. Yes. Rocco, what do you think about the idea? I've really been in the last maybe two or three weeks, I've had four people that I know have all had cancer diagnoses. And, you know, I don't know, some cancer these days is much more treatable than others. But it just, it just reminds me that so often I've got the, the mindset that I'm going to be healthy. I've got a long life ahead of me. I've still got time to do things. And I've really been thinking that I just can't think that way anymore. Life, you know, good news tends to take years of hard work to get. Bad news tends to come unexpectedly where you just, you know, doctors visit and he sees something or something like that. So I've just been really, this, this weekend's been, it's been a long weekend in America. So we had three day weekend and I spent you know, every day at the beach with my son and family, friends, just good times, just trying to really think about what's important in life. And uh, that it's really shaken me up, I guess. So I've, I've really got that notion of life is just so precious. We don't have all day and uh, we have to, we have to make it count and not, not just meaning don't put off that project for your, you know, career aspirations, but just enjoy every fucking day. And that's the, that's the mindset that I want to have the rest of my life is just every single day. I want to enjoy it. Of course, you can have some days better than others. You have to do things you don't want to do sometimes, but I really want to take that mindset for the rest of my days. Yeah. It's, um, it's a, it's a paradoxical irony of human beings that it takes that kind of nearness of tragedy, that kind of reminder of mortality and impermanence and, and the fact that storms arrive, trouble arise to bring us back to that sense of awareness of what to value and that we should value it. So to extract meaning and poignance out of something potentially tragic is, I think, the, the right invitation. And then the other one for me always is a reflection that um, Dimna says that to me, my wife says that to me often. She goes, you know, we've got a certain species of challenge. Almost the concept of Dharma and Karma, uh, you know, one doesn't have to believe in the the veracity of that, but just the idea of it that we have these different species of trouble and challenge that we have to face. And for friends of hers, these people constantly live with some form of illness. The husband's had stomach problems, severe stomach problems for years. And, and they're, they, them and their kids are always sick with um, like chest infections, cold sinus infections and things. But yet they don't have our challenge, our psychological challenges in life mm -hmm. and our pressures. And we all have a different species of challenge that we are sort of wired almost in this life or predisposed in this life, I believe, to to face. And all that those challenges are in some way or another, and this can sound flippant, but I mean, I think we can connect with the sentiment, is we're invited through our challenge to find out what's meaningful again in our lives. Now, how many people's stories have you heard about that had cancer? And even though it's not something you'd wish on someone, I, I've listened to those survival stories and the vast majority of them are people going, it was the wake up call that I needed. I didn't enjoy the experience. I didn't en enjoy the frailty and the vulnerability. But if I hadn't had that shot over the bows, I would never have taken stock of my life. I would never have reevaluated what mattered to me. And I think our, our troubles come to do exactly that for us. We, we think we lament our troubles. And we bewail them and bewail our lot. But as soon as we become graceful, like I was mentioning off air, and we arrive at a sense of, equ not equanimity, but acceptance that this is the way that life is going to teach me something or bring me to a, an understanding or an appreciation, I think the journey changes for us. There was also another thought I had, Rocco, and... If, if I wrote down, I've always been a goal-oriented person, all the things that I hope to achieve in the next, say, 20 years, you know, have um, siblings for my son, grow my family, hopefully have a great career, make a lot of money, travel the world, have great times, great memories, see wonderful places, enjoy wonderful moments with people I love, all these things that I hope to achieve. 
if I'm not happy until I've achieved them, it's too late because if I'm 64 and I'm like, I have ticked every single box on my dream list and I'm going to wait for that to be happy. It's just too late. So I've got this feeling now where I know that I'm working towards all these different things in my life, but I don't have to get them to be happy. I just have to know that I'm, I'm trying to get them and I'm, I'm trying to steer my, my boat the right way. And it's, it's actually been a really freeing feeling that I don't have to wait for the things anymore. Cause I went through, I remember, uh, to use my fighting analogy when I was fighting, I just, I would want to click my fingers and be like, okay, six weeks out from a fight. I just wish I could click my fingers and be done with this six weeks because I know it's going to be so hard. The training, the discipline, the diet, the anticipation, the mental challenges. And I just, I wanted the, I, I didn't appreciate any of the journeys. I just wanted to be done with it. And that's such an awful way to go through life because if you go through life like that, you, you, you know, waste, waste, waste your youth. Yeah. You just missed the, our pilgrimage is like, Life is a pilgrimage, and the the end point is not the point. The destination is is not the the goal. the 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 destination is experience, which means always lead home. You know, and um, yeah, but you know, it's not something you can can chastise yourself about either. Because I mean, isn't that just the way youth is? You only really appreciate yeah. your youth once you hit the autumn of your life, and you go, oh shit. I burned my whole summer waiting for next week, waiting for tomorrow, waiting for next month, waiting for this, waiting for that. And I I just I almost missed the experience, almost, almost. But you finally arrive at this kind of like wisdom. And to me, it's it's I always reflect on it like autumn, fall. It's you still got some youth in you, but you've also got this wisdom and this hindsight and this this perspective and this um these sense of achievements, lived achievements inside of yourself. And thank God for that, because now you can really enjoy with eyes wide open the bit of youth that you have, the the vitality, the the essence of life, the the enjoyment, the light, etc. I was going to say it's so hard when you're in a sh- like anyone listens to this if they're in a really shitty situation, whether it's a terrible position at work, or they just lost their job they liked, and they have no they're, they're scared about having no security, or they're, they're in a shitty romantic relationship. It's so hard to see at the time, but I always think back to the most toxic, unhealthy relationship was the one that I had before I met my wife. So it's like, if, and I remember being so miserable at the time thinking, Jesus, how am I in a relationship this just ridiculously like childish and toxic when I'm in my late thirties? And I'm just, it's, but now, of course, with hindsight, it was, you know, that, that experience and ending it was the best thing that happened to me because I met my wife and we're, we're so compatible. But it's just so hard to see when you're in it. I think one of the hardest things for, for winners in life in quotation marks is that when to stop fighting, when to accept a loss and move on as opposed to the, like I used the romantic relationship example. So many people are so used to winning in life. They'll try and force a square peg in a round hole for months and months and months That's too it. long That's as opposed it. to walking away and accepting the loss. There's a beautiful quote by Walt Whitman that goes, these are the days we must live. And when you're in the heart of a difficult moment, that is your invitation to, you know, gumption and, and character. And this is how you decide and, and life helps you define how you face things, your stance, your stance. That is the most powerful thing. I, I, this, this insight came to me recently, beautiful insight, that emotion it's tied to the Latin word for motion, for movement. And so often our emotions move us. And it's because of how we rig the sails of our psychology. And what emotion is, is it doesn't seek to be harbored within us or held within us or contained within us. It seeks to move through us. And the the call of emotion, the, the request that it has, is for expression or for action. And the way to embody a sense of expression and action in the most wise way is stance. The way that you face what you face without having to say or do anything is your stance. And if you can, that is the heart of of self-mastery really, is if you can choose how you face what you face, it speaks for itself. It acts for itself. You don't need to throw words at a situation. You don't need to rush forward clumsily to try and patch something together because your stance speaks so voluminously 
for your about your philosophy in life. And that's what it means to embody your philosophy. It's in this stance. And uh, it's so easy. What sounds so easy when 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 you when you finally arrive at some grace or some equanimity in your life to look back and say, yes, no, if you're if you're struggling, um, you know, all you got to do is just got to find equanimity and you know put a brave face on, and and somebody goes, fuck, man, I'm I'm so low down on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm struggling to put food on my table. I am struggling with just. My nervous system doesn't know how to belong to this fucking moment. I'm so, I'm in so much distress and unhappiness. It's almost impossible to find grace and equanimity there. But the point is, if you don't start finding it there, you don't find it anywhere. It's paradox. Always. I love that massive hierarchy of needs. Cause if like that example, you're just saying someone's kind of a rock bottom and they're struggling. If they focus on that bottom of the hierarchy, which is air, water, food, rest, like the you know, shelter, the real basic things of life, that yeah, that's the yeah. first step, isn't it? It's like if if you're really depressed and you at least try to, you know, you're too depressed to even work out, but maybe you can go for a walk, and maybe you can just get outside, and maybe you can just not, I don't know, drink drink alcohol every day. Maybe just try and ease up on that, and try and just drink water, mm. and try and eat slightly healthier foods. Isn't isn't that the start? Like, um, do you have any experience helping people get from rock bottom? Yeah, I do. So there's a couple of there's two paradigms that I used to look at this. The one is called the leaky boat and the four buckets. And the the premise is that your life as a metaphor is you trying to cross choppy open seas in a leaky boat, and it's taking on water. And so there's a destination that you're trying to reach, but it's beyond your sight. It's beyond the horizon. And everything around you is troubled open waters. And you don't know when another storm's going to come. But the, the, the here and now problem is that your boat is taking on water. You can't even worry too much about which angle you're going to head or how you're going to rig the sails. Some of that matters less than just keeping your boat afloat. And the four buckets are the four primary in neurochemical agents of balance or happiness or contentment in life. So two of them are hormones and two of them are neurotransmitters. So you've got serotonin, which is your mood stabilizer. You've got oxytocin, which is the connection hormone. You've got endorphins, which is the, the responsible for our sense of vitality, which we inherit through effort and exertion. And then we have dopamine, which is responsible for our motivation and our reward cycle. Now, when our mood is low, you can imagine that's one bucket that's broken or the handle's broken or it's got a crack in it and it's offline. So your serotonin is not available and you can't fix it and change it. So you theoretically, what you should be doing is spreading the load over the other three buckets. You should be investing in connection. Even if you don't feel like socializing with your friends, you have to first of all have discernment and choose the right kind of company for the right length of time. And moderate it so that you're not overexpending yourself when you actually need to be withdrawn and, and recharging. You need to be exercising, going for walks, going for runs, doing exertion, dancing, jujitsu, something that gets those endorphins flowing and gives you that sense of vitality back in your life. And you also need to create a framework of objectives in your life that are achievable, but not on the, that aren't so far beyond you that you can never get those dopamine hits from the third, but fourth bucket. Because if you do, the subconscious, the the soft animal in you, will eventually start reaching for the near to hand chains to pull in the dark, and that's our excessive eating, our binge watching, our doom scrolling, our porn addictions. People are addicted to dating, easy dating on Tinder, and the, they they don't even know the reason. They just deal with the shame. But if you take the shame out of the equation, you just look at what that bucket is. It's dopamine. And if you're not spreading the load across your other two buckets, being oxytocin for connection and endorphins for exercise, your mood never regulates. In fact, you get more down on yourself because eventually hedonic adaptation takes place. And whatever you are reaching for, in terms of impulsiveness or excess, like snacking, like porn, like movies, like any form of distraction or dependency or addiction, even weed sometimes, you you overtax that bucket. And so if you think of it like trying to bail water, you've dropped three buckets on the floor. You've dropped 
dropped your, your mood stabilizer, serotonin. You've dropped your oxytocin connection and you've dropped your endorphins vitality and you're trying to bail water in the boat of your life just through your dopamine. And of course, it's going to have a downward spiral because that is the nature of addiction. Addiction always wants more of a hit, more of a hit, more of a hit. And when you're only using one bucket, your whole life can drag itself down into an, a, a, a downward spiral. And and even victimhood can give you a sense of that and doom scrolling and binge watching. And there's so many things in our modern life that can drag us down. And simply understanding that, that you can't revolutionize your amount of serotonin, but you can get up every morning and go and for a walk in the sunrise. You can meditate. You can do a bit of yoga. And these things at least help you regulate the little bit of serotonin that you do have. And then you spread the load healthily across the other three buckets. And that's the way to bring yourself up. Now, that to me, we can talk as much as we want. But when you can start explaining to people how to bail water with all four buckets, even if they are slightly compromised, you might have a, a sore leg and you can't go run. But if you can tell somebody other ways to, first of all, spread the load across the other three buckets and what you could do to, to still get some um, endorphins into the mix, now they've got, first of all, an understanding of the mechanics of themselves. And secondly, they've actually got a means to start doing that, which gets to the heart of the second suggestion that I was going to make is to understand the relationship between certainty self-belief and motivation if you don't know where it is that you want to go which path to follow to get there whatever conundrum you're faced with you are going to be depressed and frustrated because no amount of effort will get you there if you don't know the way to turn if somebody drops you in the middle of a desert and says find your way home and it could be five miles to the nearest town or 50 miles across the desert just the sense of not knowing the uncertainty of which direction to choose can be debilitating to a person. The second one is self-belief that I've actually got what it takes to even cross that five miles. And that's where fitness comes in, fitness of mindset, fitness of stillness, fitness of physical exertion, fitness of emotional competence so I can deal with conflict and arguments and stuff in my life without becoming derailed. And once I know those two things, once I have some degree of certainty as to the direction I'm heading, and I've got some degree of self-belief that I actually have what it takes to do that, I have all the motivation that I need. Because the reason we lack motivation is not because we're weak, it's because we don't know the way to go, and we don't know we've got what it takes. So, and, and those two scenarios are a lack of vulnerability, asking for help and really listening, and self-knowledge, really knowing what it is that we want from life so that we're not chasing other people's goals. We're not chasing outer ambitions so that we can, you know, uh, find that in ourselves and then setting expectations in the short term that are realistic so that we're not trying to climb the mountain today. We're breaking up the mountain into X number of stages. And we say to ourselves, stage one, is just cross the bridge, just cross the bridge. And what is that bridge? It's the the choice to say, it might not be today, it might not be this year, it might not be the next decade, but I am climbing that goddamn mountain. To own the challenge of your own life is crossing the bridge. Then everything from there becomes a daring adventure of curiosity, discovery, delight, surprise, frustration. And your whole life is basically teaching you through trial and error the way that you should follow. Now. Imagine trying to learn jiu-jitsu from books and VHS tapes. You can't do that. Well, you can, just not very well. It'll take you so much longer. The quickest way is to, there's a different modality that gets you there. There's a different modality that gets you successful in poetry writing or open water swimming or relationship, conscious relationship or parenting. Or And we all need certainty, self-belief and motivation. And they're like a triad that we develop, but we don't develop that triad by picking up snippets of um, wisdom off the internet. We have to get into community with people and find the right people to follow, people of good conviction, good direction. And the biggest problem we have in that space is let's say somebody is a successful businessman or runs a successful podcast or 
um, has a successful cryptocurrency investment portfolio. So much of their success is based on opportunity, happy accident, coincidence, and some, some application of skill or talent. But their ability to articulate that is where the, the error comes in. And they will give you the 20-step that they thought it took to get them there. But they just might be unaware of what it actually took. And so a thousand people can look at that paragon of success and go, I want to be like him. He's put out a book of 20 steps. I'm going to follow those 20 steps faithfully, and I'm going to have failure, and I'm going to in turn that failure as myself, not being good enough or clever enough or wise enough or dedicated enough. And all it was was that person wasn't just because they can do doesn't mean they can teach. And now they're teaching everybody to do these superfluous random 20 things which don't actually conspire to deliver the same result. And so we rob people of certainty and of self-belief and therefore of motivation. So choosing the people to follow and understanding that our journeys are so unique and different and learning enough about yourself to be able to qualify and give yourself permission to listen to gurus and experts to a point but then take your own counsel to a point is the point of an examined life, the journey of a lifetime. So that was beautiful, Rocco. I, I'm going to re-listen to that several times because that was really poignant. And uh, yeah, 100%, you, you, you summarized that up really well. I love what you said about the happy accident of success because I was always one of these people. I've always been a hard worker. And when I look back at when I became very wealthy in my 20s, for a, for a non for an evening person to be getting up at five every day, going to work, trading, fighting, fighting for every trade, standing and screaming all day, then leaving my trading company, setting up my own trading company, made all this money. It's easy for me to say, yeah, I worked really hard, I took risks, and I did. That's all true. But I was also there at a time when there was money to be made because I can tell you when I left the floor, the money was slow. Every year was not there to be made, and now I still have friends that are still down there trying. And good luck, they're all struggling. They're down money. It's just it's a it's a ghost town. It's awful seeing the faces down there now. So that was great example of me for years thinking anything that I'm proud of was due to hard work and not realizing that the accident of success. And you can see that in almost anyone, right place, right time, in everything, in everything. Yeah. You know, you look at someone like Hodger Gracie and you just go, fuck, what a phenomenon on the mat that person is. But then you also realize what it would have been to be born into the Gracie family at six foot four, built like, I mean, if you could design a jujitsu judoka in a lab, you would come up with Roger Gracie. So I'm not saying he he doesn't deserve it, but you couldn't do all the same things he did and get the same results. 100%. And you can't do all the same things Tony Robbins does or Elon Musk did or necessarily and get the same results because some of it wasn't to do with the, the, the magic that they concocted in the crucible of their own genius. It was uh, an amplification of opportunity, an amplification of celebrity, an amplification of um, blessings. And we don't always know the level of influence and input that has to each of us differently and separately. Yeah? But Rocco, at the same time, when you mm. when you examine greatness, you can still get a lot of great traits, things like, you know, self belief, things like of course. discipline, of you know, course. things like that. So yeah, that, that just, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. There, there was um, and so of, it's um, it's an, another good part of life is to examine how people are getting along and look at the sameness in great people and try and synthesize what is that. It's a worthy life to ask those questions and to live with that observation. Yeah. Why do you think so many people are so depressed right now? Like all all these negative metrics in America are all time highs. Whether it's suicide, whether it's um, yeah. addiction, whether it's yeah. unhappiness, yeah. whether it's people that are single looking they want to be in relationships mm -hmm. but they can't meet anybody. Why do you think all these metrics are so bad right now? Yeah. Sure. That's a beautiful question because um, it's really the question, isn't it? Hmm. Because we all we all following the the dream and often the American dream and yet it's it's turning into a nightmare. So, yeah, I've again got uh, two parts or two answers to that. So it's, I'm going to go on another little diatribe here, but 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 hopefully it's another enjoyable one. And so the first is this insight that I arrived at, and I don't know which one to go first. So the one is about 
having shared dreams. And the second one is about a sense of soul. So I'll just say the one about dreams first. This, these words came to me in one of my evenings of, of deep contemplation, that if you don't have a shared dream, if you don't have a shared dream, very soon you will enjoy dysfunction, conflict, and a shared nightmare. Now, that is true in a family. It's true in a business. It's true in a relationship. If you can't establish the foundations of a shared dream, it means even in your efforts to actualize or to pursue happiness, it often comes in conflict with someone else's efforts or at the cost of someone else's efforts. And I think for a while now, America has not had a shared dream. It's not anyone's fault, and it's everyone's fault. And that sounds paradoxical until you realize that there was once upon a time when we had shared frameworks of connection and understanding and of meaning. And there's lots of ways to divide that generationally, racially, religiously, ethnically, country of origin, economically, so many ways, the sexes, and now politically as well. And so you have all of that, but then in between that, our art, our music, our movies, which is really how we cultivated and fostered our shared dreams. It used to be the same. We used to watch the last episode of Dukes of Hazard or the cliffhanger in Knight Rider. And then the kids would all get together on the playground and the adults would get together at the water cooler at work and they were having a shared experience and they were learning lessons and, and, and figuring out what they had seen, what they watched and kind of making sense of it together and developing a shared language and a shared predictive model and paradigm around a shared unfolding. And with the advent of streaming music and streaming services and social media feeds, the age of the individual, we are realizing what I was talking to you about off air is that with all of our piss and vinegar and our conviction, we actually don't do well as social animals when we're left completely to our own devices. We actually need shared frames of reference. We need shared predictive models. We need shared not just shared values, because I think if you go deep enough in anyone's psychology, we all have shared values, with the exception of narcissists and sociopaths. Most people just want to be happy, to be well, to be safe, to be accepted as as um, individual or as different or as homogenous as they are. But we don't have that common frame of experience anymore. And then you give young people, all people really, you give them a ton of virtual experience. Hmm. So you give them a binge watch movies and these very single serving artificial sweetener packets of exchange and connection on, on the internet, on social media. And with, with all of that, what they don't have is the counterbalance of lived experience to help them integrate all of this synthetic virtual experience. And it overloads our system and we get unrealistic expectations, unrealistic demands. We don't know how to connect with people. We become dysregulated inside of ourselves. So we become dysfunctional. It's like changing every bee or every ant in the nest or in the hive, their chemical read and signature off by five degrees or 5%. Some are close enough for us to still get along with, but across the milieu of the whole thing, there's this dysfunction and this disconnection. So I think that's one of the reasons. And the other reason is this word soul, which we like to consider as like a soft concept or the domain of crystal waving hippies or of a religious fanatics. But really what soul is, is it's the wellspring inside of us of our sense of meaning, our sense of vitality, our sense of belonging, and our sense of connection. Now, it doesn't matter how hard-nosed of a human being you are, we all thrive from vitality, connection, belonging, and meaning. But if we're not prizing those things because our systems, our institutions, our language, our cultural framings have depleted that sense of soul, the way businesses run, the way business is done, 
the way exchange and connection happens on social media, the way we're all disconnected in different streaming feeds. We don't have that shared sense of soul anymore. And COVID was a big derailer, psychological derailer, because it isolated people and amplified their sense of us of psychological isolation with a physical isolation, which really changed the the granularity or or the perspective or the the resolution of the screen that we, we looked at our own isolation through. And suddenly it it made it a lot starker and clearer. And what we are suffering from altogether is a sense of isolation, a sense of depletion, a sense of meaninglessness, like languishing under meaninglessness and disconnection. And we don't know that we ought to or could or would benefit from a reconnection with our sense of purpose. And that collectively is the word soul. And so all the things we do, our food, our holidays, our vacations, our intimacy, our sex, our together time, our everything has been leached of soul. And we don't know that that's the medicine that we're missing. And so I've got a saying that says we made of the illness, the illness, the illness is our clever, reductionist, heartless self-interest, the way that the world works at the moment. We made of the illness a dungeon, and within it we tortured and imprisoned the cure. So if we look at our our sense of belonging, our sense of meaning, our sense of connection, you're not, in in corporate business, for example, you're not allowed to mention those things because you sound wacky. And yet that is the illness that we're all suffering from. And so we try to be ever more proper and ever more correct and ever more clever and ever more alpha and ever more whatever it is which takes us further and further and further away from our interconnectedness our vulnerability our sense of meaning etc and this left brain way of looking at the world facts and details is it's not bring us the comfort that we need mm-hmm. we're chasing it and as you and i have spoken a lot about this before lawrence we chase safety but to chase safety is to compromise your your liberty. Safety is an illusion. You can't be, you have to take risks, you know, and life is risk. And the more and more and more and more and more we cede our control to controlling corporations and controlling governments and controlling um, social media platforms, they don't have to be evil to covet that control and to seek more because there's an American dream that says more is better. And so now we end up in a situation where we are so unsafe and unwell inside of ourselves that we seek paradoxically more safety and more certainty. And so in order to seek more safety and more certainty, we try to reduce everything down more scientifically or more clinically or more. And it's the wrong direction. Whereas our sense of meaning and purpose and belonging is back into the mythic back into the poetic, back into the symbolic, back into the artistic, back into the inspirational. And we've lost the the art of expressing that, and we've lost the sense of understanding how valuable and meaningful it is to our wellness. Again, beautiful, beautiful, brother. One thing, what can deteriorate can also be improved. That's the beautiful thing about human beings. So there's great hope here. Because all we have to do is just wake up to that realization and we can start taking steps even in our own lives. But when I hear lives. that, the, the overriding thing is just people spend too much time with technology and not enough time with people. And I'll use the example of jiu-jitsu. One of the reasons that jiu-jitsu is just exploding around the world now, so many of my friends never done any martial arts, not particularly athletic now, maybe when they're younger, but they've got their kids in jiu-jitsu and they say it's the best thing for their kids. And all the people that I know, one of the reasons they love jiu-jitsu, even though it's breaking our bodies and our joints and our necks and our backs, the reason we keep coming back to the mat is because you're having real intimate connection with people and maybe something... And vulnerability. You know, vulnerability. But I mean, for me personally, turning, you know, having my phone in my gym bag for an hour and a half and just working out then talking to people between matches, even if it's just a few sentences here and there, then 10, 15 minutes in the change rooms chatting... That for me completely rejuvenates my soul. 
the human interaction, it's the exercise, it's the camaraderie, it's the goal setting. I'm getting all those, the dopamine, I'm getting all these great things from it. All the, you're hitting all those buckets. Yeah. Because yes, you're exactly. getting the connection with other people. You're getting the endorphins. You're getting the dopamine because you, you know, you're winning a couple of points in the role. Yeah. It's the whole you, thing. You get, but, but I think too many That's people it. now, I just think we're, we're such an interesting generation, Rocco, because we're, we're similar in age in the fact that I think we probably had a similar upbringing in, in our youth where, you know, I, I got my first cell phone when I was, uh, my last year of college. So, and then actually when I moved, when I moved, I moved to Amsterdam and then I moved to the US and for about a year, I was just like, I don't have a cell phone. I don't want people to bother me when I'm out. Such a, <laughs> the thought of not having a cell phone now for about a year was, was wild, but you're so much happier because technology enables, so we, we could never have locked down the world with COVID if it was a generation ago, because there wasn't the capacity to keep all these businesses working digitally. Whereas so technology enables people so and even now, I know people that yeah. for days days at a time won't leave their home because they're getting their food delivered by Uber Eats, they're getting their entertainment streamed, they're getting their porn streamed or whatever they're yeah, doing. That's, that's, and they, they literally don't leave for days and days yeah. at a time. And so technology enables us to have yeah. these lives. Now some people don't have the wherewithal to practice the right wisdom. Yeah. So when I'm when I'm hearing you explaining so eloquently about the problems we're seeing in the West, so much of it is just, you know, if you're a kid put down the tablet and get outside and play. If you're an adult, put turn your phone off and go and hang out with friends for a few hours. You know, it, it seems to always come back yeah. to technology. But you know, Lawrence, now we've become our parents, right? You know, your children shouldn't watch so much TV. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Now, the point is technology is marching onwards and innovation is marching onwards and opportunity is marching onwards. The only problem really is in this point that I was trying to make earlier on, which is our synthetic experience and exposure to synthetic experiences and virtual experiences is amplified and fractally exploded. But our opportunities for and our sense to moderate that with lived experience and just traction in life so that we can integrate these things is compromised. Now, Every single thing, whether it's road running, jujitsu, trading, property, selling, relationships, we don't have the benefit or the blessing of walking this perfect middle line. It's a pendulum. And discomfort is the cure for apathy. And extreme discomfort is the cure for extreme apathy. And we these are the days we must live. We have to go through the the ugly turn so that we can collectively arrive at a wisdom. You know, the reason why we don't have world wars anymore is because we had them so thoroughly twice that everybody goes, fuck, geez, that has to be a last, last, last resort because that was horrendous. And unfortunately, that is the only way that wisdom really can arrive in people. It can't arrive in people, in individuals. It has to arrive collectively through making egregious mistakes. So it's hard to see that. But we're in an adaption phase or cycle right now. So when email first came out, we didn't know how to handle it well. When um, any any technology that we get, when we first get it, we don't know how to moderate and regulate. And, and it, it's it's in the fucking up and the getting it wrong that we slowly learn to master ourselves and coexist with these gifts. And where does one find the adult? tenacity and common sense to choose against your lower nature like no no just put it down and go play outside when you're so starved for connection i think that's what's so hard rocco is i consider myself an extremely driven disciplined person and i think you i was reading something that you wrote recently on on instagram i think where you were talking about how addictive it is where you just go on to do something and then 30 or 40 minutes later you just realize you've been mindlessly scrolling because these um, devices yeah. and these apps are just so damn addictive. And it just happened to me. I think it happened to me just before I read that. And I was like, holy shit, here I am, someone who thinks he prizes his discipline, his, his uh, focus. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, if, if yeah. I'm calling it, then there's not, I'm not saying I'm the most disciplined person out there, but I, I'm up there. And so if I'm, the, what chance yes. does a yes. depressed teenager kid have to fight yes. against that dopamine addiction from technology? Exactly. You're right. You're so right. And this is what I mean. We don't have mass of 
available wisdoms or practices or tropes that people can subscribe to to help themselves. We have to learn these. So I'm the first voice speaking about don't delete the app from your phone. Rather, start figuring out that you're being controlled and choose to moderate or regulate or ameliorate that sense of control. And then don't try and exert control in reverse. Try and see the wisdom of self-mastery. Set your stance, set your intention before you go into the app. Do what you mean to do. Accept that you're going to fail from time to time. But every single failure, just like jiu-jitsu, becomes a building block on which you build your success and your resilience and your perspective and so on. Now, that is a social and a psychological skill we all need to learn and integrate. And it begins with one or two people. And it begins with messages like I put out there proliferating and people going, ah, yeah, actually, this is the way. Because if you just delete the app, you know you're not being honest with yourself. You're just hiding the ice cream or the cookies or not bringing them in the house and saving yourself the, the risk of eating them. That's okay for immediate triage. But the long-term game is you want to be able to walk past a buffet of ice cream and cookies and choose not to do it because that's what serves you best. But we have to arrive there slowly. We have to practice our authenticity. We have to practice our resilience. And I mean, the the opposite option isn't even there on the table. People, A, don't know that it's a disease, and B, they don't know that cold turkey is not the cure. They actually have to, like, imagine if the option was you never have weed or you are completely addicted. Those are mm. terrible options. Mm. Yeah. What is the right thing? The right thing is to develop a healthy relationship where your relationship with it is uplifting and, and net positive to your life. Now, the same should be said for anything, for pornography, for intimacy, for uh, healthy debate, for everything in life. It's not about whether the thing is good or bad. It's our relationship to the thing that we need to mature in. And it's a maturity thing. And sometimes maturity isn't just, well, you know, they should do this and they should do that. We're all someone else's they. The real thing is sometimes this way of falling and making mistakes and cocking it up is the way we learn the long way around. Mm. And then a handful of us that are, are galvanized by self-development and personal development, we can go, well, surely there's got to be an accelerator. Surely there's a, a shortcut to doing this in a wholesome way that, that leaves nothing off the table, that, you know, that doesn't skip a step. And that's mm. basically what a good jiu-jitsu school does, you know? It's it's how can I integrate all of these habits in the most effective way, the quickest way, without losing anything along the way. Yeah. It's a tough time, bro, and it's only going to get tougher, I believe. Yeah. Well, like you and I were parents, so now we're not just worrying on our behalf, we're worrying about how do I unfuck myself and then how do I integrate wisdom so that when I tell my kids something, I'm not telling them like my parents tried to tell me because I didn't listen to my parents because they were disingenuous fools. So, you know, I want to get that right too. It's We're on a hiding to nothing here, but what a worthy cause. <laughs> well, Rocco, that's one thing I want to talk to you about. I got a gift. It's by Ryan Holiday, the stoic author, and he's called The Daily Dad. And it's little, little short pages per day that you read. And it's it's really fantastic. I saw, I got it a couple of weeks ago from a friend of mine and I started at January. So I just did all of January. And the idea of January, the theme of January was kids don't listen to what you say. They watch what you do. And so don't be a hypocrite. Basically, it was, it was actually both inspiring and, and very humbling too, because it was like, in order for you to be the best parent, you have to be the best you. So you can't tell your kids not to eat extra ice cream when you're you know, eating extra dessert yeah. behind their back. And you, yeah, you can't yeah, tell yeah. them to get up on time for school when you're sleeping in. And you can't tell them to tidy up when you don't make your bed in the morning. And all these different things. And it really, it was beautiful, actually. It really, reading it really motivated me to be my best self. And I always used to have this mindset where I, I want to get back to when I was in my 20s and I was super wealthy. I never have to worry about money again. I could just spend, and I just had all the, had the safety net. But it, And then I could just really spend time with my kids and 
And then it got me thinking that, no, no, I want my kids to see me working and to see me taking risks and to see me failing sometimes and picking myself up and, and, and not to, to have this safety net luxury of having all these zeros in my bank account where I don't have to have any stress because that's not realistic. And it just, so it gave me so much, I guess, inspiration, humility, happiness, just reading it. It's like, yeah, it's what, what a, what a word, like what you said, what a worthy goal to be the best dad I want to be, which one of my, you know, the highest aim yeah. in my life right now. It's just to be my best self. Yeah, and 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 so that you can give them the kind of launch pad and clear runway of having a crack at life that we didn't necessarily easily get. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but but not making it too easy for them either because that doesn't help them really. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that was my point yeah. about not. Yeah. I don't have the that feeling where I want to create wealth again quickly. The the um. Like I'm much more patient now because I don't want life to be so easy for them that they, they like you said, that they're going to grow up never seeing struggle. Although I think even if everything you don't come talk is- to me with your fucking seven acre mansion in the Indiana <laughs> countryside. <laughs> but, uh, well, I think that's- he's like model Maserati that he cruises around the cobblestones with. Come, come in. <laughs> But Rocco, isn't that the best that the best thing about sports is it doesn't matter how good his life is outside, you can give him hardship in a safe environment where he can learn. That's right. The, that's right. The yeah. Um, the, the right sport becomes um a contained regulated analogy or instantiation of a much bigger playing arena of life, wherein they can dial the the, the the risk and the the reward up and down commensurate to their you know their capability and, and still get the right level of challenge it's it's actually a wonderful invention that human beings are responsible for is the way that we play games which you know we know that they're games so we can risk a lot but um we also can lose ourselves in the game where we we get captured by the idea of improving or winning or enough to make us play that game authentically with our whole self. And that really is the crucible of development and, you know, self-mastery. And it's, it's fantastic. Really is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And you, I know you've got two disciplines. Um, you used to have three, but you've got two, which are right on the edge of that. It's, it's, it's running, which is alone. And just endurance and just, you know, you have to eat right. You have to get up right. You have to sleep right. Otherwise you compromise the whole project. And then jujitsu, which is, you know, you in a battle with your own ego and somebody else's body. It's just a wonderful, wonderful dynamic. It's probably one of the most sophisticated dialectics we have as human beings for learning. Yeah. It's amazing. I'm assuming Victor's going to start as soon as he can fit into a rashi. Yeah. Well, that that was one of the reasons, talking about connection, one of the reasons I moved here, it was very hard mentally to leave Chicago. I had so many things there, kept, you know, that kept me there for over 20 years. And the main thing was I get to move on a street where I have two neighbors. I, I love being around and I get to see and talk to and I get that. I almost feel like part of a community with them. But also one of them is a jiu-jitsu instructor and his son is a jiu-jitsu champion and he has a school down the street. So like, that's the perfect environment to, to raise my son. So he can see, you know, what's possible. And so I think that's going to be that, that was, I don't think I'd had the courage to, I'm, we're so happy here, but I don't think I'd had the courage to move here if it wasn't for, for having two people on my street. So yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Brooker, no, you, you get no shortage of courage, Lawrence. <laughs> oh, thank you, brother. For people listening, Rocco and I spoke about close to two years ago about this. And he said at the time with your corporate job, you, you didn't, weren't really free to discuss this. Now you've, you've branched off on your own. You've taken, you've taken the leap. So, uh, I would like, you know, you've got, you're such a well rounded, deeply intellectual person. And the fact that you've gone down all these rabbit holes, I still have friends that think that th- they think nothing of themselves drinking all weekend alcohol. But they think that it's bad that I take a five milligram or ten milligram edible in the evening. They, they, they don't understand the contradiction between what they're saying because of those long-standing beliefs that certain drugs are okay in Western culture and other drugs are deemed not okay. Luckily, things are changing. I think places like Colorado and a few other states now said absolutely everything's legal. 
Um, I don't recommend people doing heroin, but I know, I think there's a professor that takes tiny doses of heroin and he's, he's got some very interesting findings. So it's just wild times. I feel like we're living through this incredible drug revolution, kind of like the sixties. And it's just really interesting just seeing all the data coming out. But I'd love to just honestly hear about some of your, your, your examinations into different psychedelics and what you got out of them. Yeah. Um, cause I just think it's so yeah, interesting. I mean, there's, there's so many things we can talk about, but let's begin with the sense of responsibility and perspective, maybe. So first of all, as I said before, it's not the substance or the platform or the Instagram or the, it's your relationship with it mm-hmm. and whether you are doing what you are doing from, from love for a sense of healing, growth, wellness, fulfillment, or you doing it as a distraction and an escape or out of fear. Anything that's done from the latter is not advisable. And not everyone's psychology and body chemistry is actually amenable to playing with your in your endogenous pharmacology. You 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 have to be responsible about this. And secondly, not everyone's psychology is predisposed to these kind of experiences because if they don't have a strong sense of boundaries, or they think they do, but for a certain disruption in their in their in their internal experience, you know they can unravel like a jumper when you pull one thread of the wool and it all unravels. You don't want to to mess with that. But children experiment, and as we experimented when we were young, we realized what species of experience we were likely to have. The first experiences we have, I was lucky I didn't have them, is socially in terrible settings, terrible circumstances. You don't know what you're taking. You don't know the volume you're taking. You're not around conscious, well-meaning, grounded individuals. You're not in necessarily a psychologically safe environment. So a lot of the stories that people hear come from that species of of, of, um, non-discerning, casual, irresponsible, daft experience. And all of that can really be thrown into the toilet because it's a lot of nonsense. The second understanding we have is the understanding we inherit from our community, our societies, and our cultures where we assume that it belongs to stoners, delinquents, addicts. That's another childish, juvenile notion that we inherited from those high school pep talk you know, gym class videos, they're just ridiculous. They're absolutely ridiculous. Sugar is responsible. Alcohol is responsible. Tobacco is responsible for more harm than all the psychedelics put together. Psychedelics are, again, different to your opioids and your pharmaceutical drugs. Pharmaceutical Mm -hmm. drugs are mind-altering and consciousness-altering. Caffeine is mind-altering and consciousness-altering. Alcohol is mind-altering and consciousness-altering. And anything that does that is a drug. Now, the fact that you can buy one with a prescription over a counter and the other one you can you can get in, in, in a gummy bear doesn't have any moral weight one way or the other. Exactly. Certain things are less, more and less healthy for your body, and, and, but it's your habits that are healthy and unhealthy more than the substance our bodies are resilient and so what you want to consider is that there is a a, a category of drugs which have subcategories so you get your certain kind of amphetamines which are great like um, mdma is great for people with ptsd and treatment resistant depressions and and then you get psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in mushroom, which is great for depression, people with fear of death, people with um, chronic illnesses that have a perspective on mortality that is covered in doom and darkness. LSD is a very different thing. And then you get your dimethyltryptamines, your 5-MeO-DMTs, the toad. Then you get cambo, and then you get iboga. Now, all these things, now there's a species of them, a whole group of them. So MDMA is an amphetamine. Cannabis, the cannabinoids, they are what you get in weed, in edibles, and so on. Your tryptamines are what you get in ayahuasca and the toad and 5-MeO-DMT. Psilocybin and mescaline is what you get in peyote and San Pedro. 
So mescaline, LSD, psilocybin, iboga, and I forget the other one. They are your psychedelics. They're the ones that give you these transformative experiences, sometimes visuals. Weed won't give you much of the visuals, but it gives you an elevated state of consciousness. And MDMA is going to be different again to weed and different again to the psychedelics. The other th question that one needs to understand when talking about this is the signature of the curve. So if you imagine a five-mile run, it's a slow start, hard slog in the beginning, then you hit that plateau when you feel really comfortable, and then eventually your body gets tired and your um, in, in endurance sort of wanes, and it gets difficult at the end. If you go into the ocean and you haven't swum for a long time and it's a new beach, you don't know the lie of the land underwater. You don't know the currents. So you go in, then you get thrown about a bit, and then you come out. Now, imagine you just got thrown in, and somebody said to you, have a, a good time, and you spend 20 minutes just finding your legs, and then they rip you out, and they go, what did you learn? You've learned nothing. If you slowly wade in, and you take your time and you start feeling the tide and feeling the currents and you choose your moments and then you you start reading where the rip is going, you can actually expend a lot less bandwidth of exertion and energy and start being in the mix and feeling the flow. And then you integrate that and then you slowly come out. That is the same paradigm as weed, ayahuasca, etc. So with DMT, if you smoke it, it's an eight-minute round trip. You blast it off into space with a vertical climb. You're in this space that you've got no language or articulation for. And then you sort of drop back down. And the shape of the curve looks like a knife put on its, on its handle. It's sharp up a peak and sharp down. There's nothing to integrate. There's nothing to relate to. It's discombobulating and disorientating. To take ayahuasca, the same drug, the come up is slow which means you're slowly acclimatizing to the experience. You're up there for long enough to not feel so discombobulated because you also climbed in slowly. And then as you slowly come down, your language and your um, perspective arrives and you can zipper the two, that experience and your lived normal worldly experience together in such a way that you actually can begin to integrate the wisdom that you've experienced. Now, if you imagine smoking weed is a nice steep curve and quite a drop down, but, but it's steep up and with a long lingering tail. But it's still maybe eight to 20 minutes of experience. Whereas if you eat edibles, that's a three hour experience. Yeah. And you, you, you also have to develop relationships with these, these medicines so that you can make the right kind of use for them. There's not to say there's a wrong way to use them, but there are more right or more skillful ways to use them for different applications or intentions. Now, a lot of people's relationship with plant medicine, for example, is healing addictions, healing trauma, and healing abuse. But growth and healing are two sides of the same coin, really. And once you've sort of got the one project solved, you can then take the same medicine and apply it to personal development and growth. And I mean, it was the latter that interested me. Obviously, I needed to process and progress a lot of my own healing, and it can be a, a powerful accelerator for that 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 process. But that, if you're doing it right, it doesn't take forever. But you also realize that you're in a kind of cognitive and psychological territory when you when you take those medicines where you can grow your soul as a person you can grow how you see the world how you see yourself your place in it your your sense of purpose your sense of awareness and i'm not saying that the wisdom that i have came from that my appetite for wisdom came from me my um efficacy was the same as going to one of the best jiu jitsu schools with the best jiu jitsu instructor and applying myself intelligently rigorously First of all, to manage my ego, because once your ego is managed, you can really learn. Your biggest impediment to jiu-jitsu is ego. Mm. 
and and your preconceived ideas. So if if you take somebody and you give them taekwondo and and Shotokan karate for seven years, and then you try to train them jujitsu, and you take a fresh kid off the street and you try to train them jujitsu, if both things being equal, the the fresh kid off the street's going to learn faster. Why? Because he's got less to unlearn. Now, if you come to psychedelics with a lifelong, first of all, set of understandings about yourself, your psychology, how the world works, our place in it, and what you can expect, you picked up from Reddit trip reports and from, you know, stupid stoner movies and from um, playground chatter. God knows what you're going to experience. Or if you buy into that whole Kool-Aid about ayahuasca and, you know, purple jaguars and feathered serpents, if that's what's in your predictive model, if that's what you're backloaded with, then you're going to be seeking and, you know, if, and I believe there is, if there is a intelligence in this universe that we are touching when we have these kind of medicines, it's always going to touch you through the language that you have integrated inside of yourself. So it's a bit like going onto the internet, but if you've got an old Mozilla browser or an old Safari browser, you will see a clunky version of that. And if you've got a different skin on your browser and a different um, coding as to how the letters and pictures should show up, then your interpretation of the truth of reality is going to be filtered and shaped by the quality of interface that you have. And our interface is our sense of mythology, our sense of poetry, our sense of language, our sense of um, what is true beyond the tangible. Now, if that language shit and skill set and paradigm set is poor or distorted or juvenile or folksy or then you're going to see and experience everything through that um, lens because the intelligence that exists in the world can only speak to you through the language that you've already internalized and you've heard me say this a million times look ludwig wittgenstein's famous quote is the limits of my language become the limits of my world and this is exactly what it means. And poetically put, it says, we cannot visit worlds for which we do not have the language. Two people can have exactly the same drug, the same physical experience, and their internal experience of it is completely, completely different mm. based on our frame of reference and our mindsets. That was incredible. I guess the big takeaway that I had from, well, I guess I'll start with my preconceived notion of marijuana and equals being a loser was because of a friend in college who just smoked all day, got thrown out after one year of college, failing his exams. So that was in my head for many, many years. I love what you said about different people react to things different ways. I've got friends that can drink obscene amounts of alcohol. They don't get too belligerent and they can get up the next day and function. It's, it's a miracle. For me, I've always processed alcohol very badly. For me, it'll knock me back a few days. I won't feel good for days. And that's not even drinking that much. So for me, I mean, I don't want to say I'm lucky, but I found what works for me is um, a, a small amount between five and ten milligrams of a good, you know, quality edible from the from the dispensary, which is very, you know, high quality. That for me is just such a positive. I get so much positive benefits out of it. I sleep great like a baby, and the next day I have no no ill effects. Whereas I have friends who get so jealous because. They'll hear me talk about how much it uplifts my spirit and it opens my mind to appreciation of life and all these different things I talk about. And that, like, man, I wish I could do that. But when I take it, I just get super paranoid. So I really appreciate what you said about different people, their body. We talk about that for a minute. Things. Yes. That paranoia is a natural, necessary barrier. So you can start off having those experiences. And with, with edible weed. And what you need to learn is a self mastery of your own psychological experience. And the root of your psychological experience is steeped in your animal experience, which is fear. Fear is how nature keeps animals alive. But if you don't develop the internal discernment between fear and danger, what weed is showing you what the medicine is showing you the edible is showing you is that your first step your foundational step is to discern between fear and danger danger you have to avoid 
Fear is a story. Mm. And if you can't regulate your own psychology and emotion and your nervous system's experience, then all of the benefits that you want to reach are not yours because you haven't earned them. The way that you've earned them is you have moderated and regulated your own discernment to be able to tell the difference between fear and danger. So my advice to people like that is I'm not telling people to take it. I'm telling people if you want the positive benefits that Lawrence is talking about, you have to practice self-mastery. And self-mastery, just like jiu-jitsu, is practiced. And the best way to practice jiu-jitsu is on the mat. You get in a position of vulnerability, and when you're uncomfortable and someone's got you locked up in a pretzel, your nervous system will tell you, this is danger, this is injury, this is catastrophe. Fear is not danger. Pain is not injury. You have to avoid injury. But pain you can get on top of because as soon as the panic ends is when you realize this isn't going anywhere. It's just uncomfortable and I can endure it. And it's the same with the discomfort of paranoia. Discomfort is not catastrophe. You have to avoid catastrophe. But discomfort is something that you learn to regulate and have equanimity about. And jiu-jitsu, probably because you did the trading, probably because you did the running, probably because you did the jiu-jitsu training, it means, and also because alcohol wouldn't give you a door for respite, you needed a respite in this in this life because it's no sign of good health to be well-adjusted in a profoundly sick environment. You needed something. And so you thought, fuck, I can't live like this forever without medicine because the world is sick. I need I need a break here. And so you had the psychological tools already exercised and developed over a long period of time to face discomfort and discern between pain and injury, discern between fear and danger, discern between discomfort and catastrophe. And that discernment is the basis of self-mastery and stillness and stance that you adopt so that when the medicine comes and threatens you with the chains at the gate, you can go, no, 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 it's not the end of the world. This will pass. And just the belief that this will pass is the same as being on a camping trip with your dog and there's a noise outside, but you know it's just the trees rustling. Mm. If you can't tell the dog, don't worry, it's nothing to be afraid of, and you believe that the dog is onto something, every time the dog growls, you get more afraid. The dog picks up your fear, it gets more afraid, and it's the self-perpetuating cycle of catastrophizing shadows. And in exactly the same way, exactly the same way, you can actually face and alchemize alchemize that um, paranoia And it actually becomes the source of enormous euphoria in your body. You actually alchemize. It's the same source. Pain and pleasure have exactly the same energy impulse. It's just how they're polarized. So if you just switch the battery terminals around on that experience in your mind and you put the drama down and you put the story down, suddenly you realize that what is screaming out from the bottom is the wellspring of your vitality, the part of you that wants to be alive. And it is just, and it can be expressed as the animus of panic and fear, or it can be expressed as elation, exaltation, vitality, and euphoria. And if you develop the right relationship with these things, just like running, everybody goes, oh my God, it's so exhausting and tiring. I think, yes, but it's a it's a thing, right? I know how to alchemize my endorphins and to feel pleasurable on the back of that. Now, if you can do that, yours is the kingdom. That's very interesting. Well, I'm going to make sure he listens to this. Um, I also really love what you said about the, the the two different experiences. If you're just thrown into turbulent sea for a few minutes and then dragged out, it's not the same as the experience as a nice swim. And one thing that the really positive experience I had with ayahuasca was with our mutual friend, Nick, who was very adamant about me setting, writing down things that I was, was asking myself to get out of it and setting intentions before and changing my diet and really making it a very, you know, it was, it was a month disciplined down, experience. Yes. A very disciplined experience. Exactly. And then even the day of where you're all sitting outside in Joshua tree and you've got your space 
and the moon's going down and you haven't even taken anything, but you're with a band of brothers who are all, you know, looking to be their best selves and face fears and ask, ask questions and find answers. And that experience before you even, before I even took it was psychedelic. I had this incredible feeling. Very much. Yeah. And, and Very so that, that's, that, that for me was such a, um, a reminder that men evolved to be in groups around men. And as much as I love my wife and my son, I've, I've worked in trading, which was me and a bunch of guys in a pit fighting for trades and getting camaraderie. And the same with, with, uh, martial arts. It's a, it's a individual sport, but you have the camaraderie of the team. And I think I really, since I retired from fighting, I really miss that. And it's something that I think is so important for me is just be around kindred spirits and get in nature and do those kind of things. Um, so I'm so glad you said that because it's so true, but you're so right. And you know, I was going to say, Lawrence, you know, getting together with men can be done without psychedelics and then it's, taking the psychedelics can be done without, without company. And yet they complement each other and they all have their place in a, in a well-rounded, uh, program or, or, or attitude of wellness. Yeah. yeah. I know. I, I couldn't agree more. No, brother, I was just going to say, I know, you, I know you've got um, some meetings, so you got to wrap this up, but Rocco, I really appreciate your wisdom. And, uh, it's, it's real fun through podcasts where I can just listen and learn. I don't even have to say much. And that's that's what I get from you, brother. I, I really can't wait to listen back to this because you said so many things that um, no, no, and it's um you you put in eloquent words things I've been thinking about, or you connected some dots that I was of, of things I've been thinking, which is always the same when we talk. So I always appreciate you, brother. And uh and and while I said that a lot of yeah. the negatives in today's society are linked to technology, I always say and I always talk about each other friends. I'm like We've never met in person, but I consider you a dear friend and all our communications been virtual because you live in Perth and I live in US. So uh, one day I want to run the Perth Marathon, take you out for a steak and give you a big hug. But for now, our relationship is online because of the beauties of, of technology. So as much as I talk shit about technology, That's I do awesome. appreciate it <laughs> for the good things. Yeah. It's, um, and it's a, it's a relationship that's just getting richer as we both continue our journey of you know, putting down the drama and leaning into our journeys of um, being husbands, being parents, um, getting older. It's just uh, even struggling through difficulty. It's it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And, um, you know, one thing that you are so perennial about is your sense of appreciation of life and your gratitude and your the real exuberance that you show when you connect with your friends. And it's one of the most beautiful things about you. So I wanted to reflect that back to you. I appreciate it, Rocco. I love you, brother. Get going. Let's talk soon. Okay. You take care. And thanks for having me on for this wonderful, thoughtful conversation. And just to let the reader or the listeners know, I'll be coming out with a book in the next uh, month. It's called Stepping Through. And it's all about this kind of weaving of, of psychology and wisdom and pragmatism and a bit of poetry and a bit of straight talk and a bit of just life insights. And it's, it's meant to be a companion and a physician for people that you don't have to read it back cover to cover, but you pick it up when you're dealing with need for forgiveness or for reconciliation or for ending of things or for new beginnings or, and it's got this quality or this sort of species of perspective woven in through the whole thing. So I thought that might be helpful for people. Oh, Maybe I'll come on again and plug it when when the time is right. Okay. Brother, anytime. We'll make it happen. Okay, I'll buddy. Thank you. <clears throat>